Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and maths tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. Also, I just want to preface this video by saying, um, sorry if I'm really nasal throughout. My hay fever has been going insane. I promise I'm not some snotty kid who's like, you got any games on your phone? Or anything like that. In one species of squirrel, Scurious colorinensis, fur color is controlled by one gene with two codominant alleles. C big G represents the allele for gray fur color, and C big B represents the allele for black fur color. Table one shows one of the, shows the three possible phenotypes. So we've got CGCG, which is gray, CGCB, which is brown black fur, and then CBCB, which is black fur. So yeah, in a population of 34s whatever blah blah blahs. Two had black fur. Use the Hardy Weinberg equation to estimate how many squirrels in this population had black brown fur and show your working. First of all, you need to decide what P and Q are. So I'm going to say P is, you know, big G, which is gray. And we're going to say Q is big B, which is black. And PQ, so they've told us in a population of 34 individuals, they had, uh, sorry, two had black fur. So that must mean that Q squared, as in CBCB, has to be um, two. So this means that the proportion of them or the percentage of them would be two out of 34, right? So that would give us, if I do that in the calculator, two divided by 34, that gives you 0 0.0588, blah, blah, blah. That means Q is the square root of two over 34, 0 0.2425, blah, blah, blah. So now we know what Q is, we can work out P because P plus Q equals one. So P equals one minus Q, which is going to be one minus zero, one minus 0 0.2425, blah, blah, blah. Which is going to be 0 0.757. Right. Now that we have that, we need to work out how many of these populations had brown black fur. So in order to have brown black, you need to have um, C, G, and C, B. Right, so C, G, and C, B. But they could also have C, B, and C, G. However, those are like, the same phenotype, obviously. So this would be, well, that would be um, PQ and that would be QP. And that's where the 2PQ part comes in the equation. So P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. That's where that 2PQ part comes from, is from this. So we're looking for that. All you do is you just work out what 2 times P times Q is, or you could do P squared and Q squared and then take those away from 1. So 2 times P times Q would equal. Uh, 2 times P, which we've just worked out to be 0 0.757, blah, 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 times Q, which is 0 0.2425, blah, blah, blah. So if we do that, 2 times 0 0.757 times 0 0.2425, we get 0 0.367, blah, blah, blah. But this is only the percentage in decimals of what the, um, what the proportion is of this population. They've asked us to work out how many individuals have brown black fur. So we need to work out this percentage of 32, 34, sorry. So therefore your answer would just be 34 times the answer and that'll tell you what it is, which is 12.48, so 12. Because you can't have like 0 0.48 of an animal. Okay, so the actual number of squirrels in the population that had black brown, black brown fur was 16. Use all the information to calculate the actual frequency of the CG allele and do not use the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So in our total population, we have 34 individuals. And remember, these are diploid organisms. So there's, in total, the number of alleles we have for fur color is going to be 34 times 2, one from mom, one from dad. So we need to think of all the possibilities here. So first of all, we've got 34 individuals. So 34 individuals. And this is all for one gene. And it's got two alleles. So therefore, the number of alleles the total number of alleles is going to be 34 times 2, which is 68. CBCB is black fur, and there are two individuals with it. The number of individuals with brown black fur is CGCB, and that is 16 individuals. So therefore, what's left has to be the number with um, gray. So that's CGCG. So CGCG is going to be 34 minus the 2 minus 16, which leaves us with 16. So now if we look at the allele breakdown here, 
if there's 16 individuals of CGCG, that means that there's going to be 16 plus 16 lots of CG here, 16 and 16 here, but here there's only one 16. The total number of CGs present is going to be 16 plus 16 plus 16, which is 48. And we're doing this over a total of 68 alleles impossible, uh, possible. So it's 48 over 68 equals 0 0.705, which is 0 0.7. This species were first introduced into the UK from North America in the 1870s. They're now widely distributed across the UK. These species from both North America and the UK show exactly the same genotypic and phenotypic variation. An identical mutation causing black fur has also been found in several other species closely related to this. Use the information to choose which one of the following conclusions is likely to be true and tick one box. The mutation that caused black fur happened after they were introduced. No, because we can establish from the previous question that they've already had them to begin with. The mutation that caused black fur happened in a common ancestor of these species, possibly. The mutation that caused black fur happened independently in all the other species. No, because it tells you that the mutation causing black fur has been found in species closely related to them. So, <clears throat> so, so far, the only thing that's really supporting us here is that this common ancestor probably had this allele and it's been passed on. The phenotypic variation and other closely related species is caused by genetic drift. Not, not really. Because genetic drift is implying that by chance this has happened. And it's, you know, it's kind of, un it's, it's not very likely for, you know, in such a short time frame for genetic drift to have such a massive role. So it's probably that they had this mutation in an ancestor and now obviously, you know, all these different species have that. The mutation that caused the CV allele was due to a 24 base pair dilution with the CG allele. The protein coded by the CV allele was 306 amino acids long. Calculate the percentage reduction in size of the protein coded for by CB allele compared to the protein by the CG allele and give your answer to three significant figures that show you working. Right. So we need to go backwards here. So 306 amino acids. So one triplet makes an amino acid, right? So if we've got 306 amino acids, then the base, the bases we have must be 306 times by three, which is 918. And they've told us that CB is because there's a 24 base, uh, sorry, base pair deletion from the CG. So therefore, in CG, we must have 918 plus 24 bases, which gives you 942. So therefore, the number of amino acids from CG has to be 942 divided by 3. 942 divided by 3, which is 314. The difference equals 314 minus 306, which is 8. And then all you do is you divide the difference by, by the new, so 314 times 100, and that gives you 2.55%. In S. Carolyn, whatever, fur color depends on the distribution and the relative amounts of light pigment and dark pigments. And figure 1 shows how the protein produced from the CG allele can result in the production of a light pigment or a dark pigment. So we've got CG allele codes for the production of a receptor protein to a hormone called alpha-MSH. Let's see what's going on here. So alpha-MSH binds to glutamic acid uh, in the receptor protein. Alpha-MSH leaves it, and then a receptor protein becomes activated, and dark pigment is produced. Well, what happens is, is that a protein called ACIP binds sorry, competitively to the receptor protein. Alpha-MSH is blocked. The receptor protein is not activated, and the light pigment is produced. So, the deletion that causes the mutation in the CB allele results in the production of a receptor protein that does not have glutamic acid. The lack of glutamic acid and the receptor protein has the same effect as alpha mesh leaving the receptor protein. So, use figure one and this information to suggest, like this species with the genotype CBCB, have gray fur, sorry, black fur rather than gray fur. So it's saying that when we have this um, lack of glutamic acid, it has the same effect as alpha MSH relieving the receptor protein. So what's happening here is we're stuck in an eternal state of this going on. If you constantly have alpha MSH, you know, like left, then this receptor protein's activated. So if you've got this re this receptor protein activated, then only the dark pigment's produced. You can't have alpha MSH binding to it and doing its stuff because it's always activated and it's always ready to go. And what, what also might lead to a problem is that obviously to go down this pathway, you need to bind ACIP to this receptor because the receptor is already activated. You know, ACIP might not actually be able to bind to it, so you already start making a dark pigment. So, it's permanent activation of the receptor protein. Why? Because the receptor. 
no longer needs binding of alpha MSA. Therefore, only the dark pigment is produced. And also, like I said before, you could also talk about how ASIP's not able to actually bind to it. Describe how HIV is replicated once inside helper T cells. So it doesn't want you to talk about the attachment proteins and this and that, blah, blah, blah. It's just wanting to talk about how HIV replicates. So HIV is a retrovirus, meaning that it has RNA and it converts into DNA and then it gets incorporated into the cell's you know, DNA and then it's, then it's read and through transcription and translation to produce new viral particles. There's lots of viruses that also do this. It's important to just appreciate that this isn't just restricted to HIV. If you ever see a retrovirus, it also does this. So it's just the standard thing here, really, of saying RNA is converted into DNA. And you need to say how using reverse transcriptase. A way of remembering is that when you transcript something, you're going from DNA to RNA. So reverse transcriptase is from RNA to DNA. Then what happens is, is that the DNA is incorporated or added or inserted to, uh, incorporated into the host cell genome or DNA or something like, just basically words to that effect. The DNA is transcribed and translated, you can't just say it's like red or anything, you need to clarify that it's been transcribed and translated into HIV mRNA. And new viral proteins. Those are your last two marks. Sorry, I should have separated them into two different lines. Whenever you're talking about viruses replicating in this way and they're doing the sort of reverse transcriptase stuff, you need to say that the DNA is transcribed into a viral mRNA and then it's translated at ribosomes to form the new proteins. You cannot just say, like, you know, it's red and then makes new particles. That's not enough detail. HIV-1 is the most common type of HIV. It binds to a receptor on hepatitis cells called CCR5. Current treatment for HIV-1 involves the use of daily antiretroviral therapy, ART, to stop the virus being replicated. Only 59% of HIV-positive individuals have access to ART. Scientists have found two HIV-1 positive patients, P and Q, and they've gone into remission with no detectable HIV-1. This happened after a blood, cells, so a blood stem cell transplant, BSCT. Patient P was given two BSCTs and Q was given one. All BSCTs gave up a donor with T cells without the CCR5 receptor. In addition, patient P had radiotherapy and Q had chemotherapy. Both of these treatments are toxic. Both patients P and Q stopped receiving ART 16 months after the BC BSCT. 18 months after stopping ART, both patients had no HIV-1 RNA in their plasma, no HIV DNA in their T cells, and no CCR5 in their T cells. Use the information to evaluate this use of BSCT to treat HIV infections. Like I've said in every single paper I've ever done where you see the word evaluate, compare and contrast, discuss, you need to say for and against. What they've done in this experiment is that you've got, I'm going to draw this really bad cell. This is your CCR5. Now HIV, I'm going to just draw it like this for now, attaches to it and gets into cell, does all of its stuff, right? Through that. So what they've done is they've effectively, what they've done is they've inserted cells without the CCR5 into these people. So what they've done is they've given radiotherapy and chemotherapy to destroy all of these and replace them with CCR5 less cells. No CCR5, no HIV replication. So the features that support it is that, well, obviously, in these individuals, there's no HIV, RNA, or DNA, so it could be a cure. So for both, there is no HIV, RNA, or DNA, so it may be a cure. And you need to discuss how, well, there's no CCR5, so no HIV entry. What else is so what else is good about this? Well, you don't need to take daily ART, so no need to take daily ART. They won't need to do it anymore. If it's cured them, there's no need. What else can we talk about here that's supportive? I mean, both patients P and Q had stopped having stopped needing ART sixteen months after this. Q was only given one, so it suggests that one might not, might be enough. So one um, BSCT may be enough. However, 
they also had radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and the question's asking you just to use BSCT. So because they've had both, we don't know if the BSCT alone is enough without chemotherapy. So we don't know if BSCT um, alone is effective. Right, and also, I mean, look at the sample size. We've only tried on two cases, only on two cases. Also, other things we could talk about is that we've only done it for 18 months, you know, so it's a quite a short time frame. As well as that, HIV is a virus, so it might rep it might uh, mutate and get antigenic variation, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And then be, be able to bind on different receptors. And also, it requires donors to donate BSCTs, so, sorry, uh, blood stem cells. So there might not be enough, you know, donors that are suitable. Scientists investigated movement in adult pine beetles. Adult beetles emerged from cracks in tree bark. The scientists released a newly emerged adult beetle G from the center of a sample area that had been a light source containing, sorry, that had a light source coming from one direction. They made a drawing of the beetle's path of walking. They repeated this with more beetles J, P, and R. So there's your light source, and there's, you know, the point at which the beetle was released, and there's, those, there's its movements. So it says, name the type of behavior shown by beetles G, J, P, and R, and suggest one advantage for this behavior shown. And why is it helpful? Well, I mean, think about why a beetle wants to do that. So maybe it might be that, like, it, um, you know, you can't just say something like it would move out into the open or whatever, or like outside a tree. That's not enough. That's not an advantage. It doesn't mean anything. It might be something like, I don't know, to find a food supply. Maybe if, it, maybe if they go to light, they can see food. Maybe to find a mate. Um, like, you know, to avoid competition, I guess. But, I mean, they're going towards a light. You know, things like that, basically. At higher temperatures and higher light intensities, adult pine beetles normally move more and they fly rather than walk. When preparing to fly, these beetles walk slowly. The scientists investigated the movement of these different temperatures and the light in the dark. They created a box with a half light in the, uh, that was half light in the middle and half, sorry, half light and half in the dark. They released an adult beetle, beetle in the midpoint during the light and dark areas. They recorded as a path of beetle movement and its location after five minutes. Upon this, they calculated the mean speed of movement. They repeated the experiment with many more beetles at several temperatures. Okay, fine. So here's their results. Percentage of beetles on the light side uh, and then the mean speed of movement. So the percentage of beetles on the light side seems to drop a little bit, but it kind of spikes weirdly here as temperature goes on. Like it goes up, sorry. But the mean speed of movement seems to increase as the temperature goes up and it starts to level off. And then we don't really get anything beyond 35. After studying these experiments, the scientists concluded that there's a significant change of movement between 35 and 37.5 37 degrees, that between 35 and 37, more beetles move away from the light, and between 35 and 37.5, more beetles had a slower walking speed. So let's have a look between this. Okay, well, I mean, first off the bat, you can see that the data has been stopped been collecting at 35. So there is no data between, you know, like above 30, 35 degrees. So no speed of movement. Above 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, what else can we say? The, uh, 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 between 35 and 37.5, more beetles had a slower walking speed. Well, I mean, they're saying that just beyond 35 it happens, but I mean, you can see, like, it's starting to slow down before 35 anyway, so it might be, like, you know, above, like, 32-ish, so slowing happens before 35 degrees. What else can we say? In the question, they tell you that, um, where is it? Where's it gone? <laughs> yeah, when preparing to fly, these adult bees walk slowly. So we don't know if this is just them walking slower if they're about to fly. So slowing of movement could be because they are preparing to fly. And also, what else can we talk about? I mean, there's no statistical test. They're saying that this is, uh, where is it? There's a significant change. We don't have a statistical test, so we don't know if the change in movement away from light is significant. You cannot just say, and I've said this before, the results are not significant. Please, 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 you need to say what the bit is that's statistically significant. So in this case, the, the change in movement away from light Okay, so freshwater marshes have one of the highest rates of gross primary production and net primary production of all ecosystems. Carbon use efficiency is the ratio of NPP to GPP, and freshwater marshes have a high Q. So 
GPP, gross primary production, gross just means everything without any deductions taken out. So what this means is, is production, primary production. So what you're doing is you are converting sunlight energy by plants. So that's gross. Net is what's available to consumers of plants after they've taken away respiratory losses. Because remember, plants respire. Some of the energy that they take in from the sun and absorb, blah, 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 whatever, has to be lost through respiration. Use your knowledge of NPP to explain why freshwater marshes have a high Q and the advantage of this and do not refer to abiotic factors in your answer. So NPP equals GPP, absolutely everything they could possibly you know, have energy-wise, minus respiratory losses. Obviously, one of them is that there's low respiration. And now we need to talk about the advantage of this. Well, you know, you've got more growth. They're able to convert more sunlight, blah, 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 etc., into biomass. So, for example, they could convert into glucose and stuff. Freshwater marsh soils are normally waterlogged. This creates anaerobic conditions. Use your knowledge of the nitrogen cycle to suggest why these soils have relatively high concentrations of ammonium compounds and low concentrations of nitrites and nitrates. So, if it's anaerobic, then denitrifying bacteria are going crazy because they are anaerobic bacteria. So, there's more denitrification. Why? Because denitrifying bacteria do not require oxygen. They use the nitrates in the soil instead to carry out respiration. What does this do? This converts nitrates and nitrites into nitrogen gas. And you know, that, ex that, that gets um, lost to the environment. So just as a quick reminder about the nitrogen cycle, you can have nitrogen fixation. So when you're fixing something, it's where you're putting it into a compound. So nitrogen fixation is where you're taking nitrogen gas and you're converting it into nitrogen containing back, uh, compounds. Ammonification is where you're changing nitrogen compounds into ammonia. So this is usually from dead organisms like, you know, way, uh, sorry, dead organisms are waste stuff like urine and feces. They have nitrogen compounds that are converted by ammonia and that's by saprobionts that feed on dead and waste material. Nitrification is where you are converting ammonium ions into nitrogen compounds like nitrates. Because ammonium ions can't directly be used, they have to be converted into nitrites, sorry, nitrates or, nitrites or nitrates. Because ammonium ions can be toxic. And denitrification is where you're converting nitrates and nitrites into nitrogen gas, which then escapes into the atmosphere. Right, okay, so state the assumption the student has made and suggest why this assumption might not be valid. So what they've assumed is that height correlates directly or is proportional to biomass, which we know in humans doesn't really apply because you could have a really, really short king, you know, who's like hit the gym his entire life and is pure protein and has a mass of like 8 bajillion kilograms. Whereas like a tall lanky guy might not. So they've assumed... Assumed height is proportional to biomass. Obviously, you write the full thing, I'm just doing this. And then we need to sort of talk about why. So, this is only one thing. It's a suggest why this assumption might not be valid. It might be that height, it would be like height doesn't include roots, or it wouldn't include leaves or other things like, you know, flower formation or anything like that. So at the end of the investigation, the student noted that the freshwater marsh plant had grown 268 millimeters in height and now measured 387 and calculated the growth rate to be this, blah, 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 right? So this is R equals the second one minus the first over T. So let's write down what we know. So the second one is going to be 387. The first one is going to be 387 minus the 268. 387 minus 268, because that's not the original height. That's just how much it's grown by. So that's 119. So R equals LNW2 minus LNW1 over T. So RT equals LNW2 minus LNW1. So that means that T equals LNW2 minus LNW1 over R, which is going to equal LN387 minus LN119 over 0 0.097. If you type that in your calculator, you should get 12 years. Because they wanted to, the, sorry, 12 days because they wanted to the nearest full day. So the action of endopeptidase is an exopeptase is going to increase the rate of protein digestion. Explain how. So imagine I've got this long, long protein here, right? I could either do this and break them one by one, or I could break these bonds like this. So the combining both of them means I could pull them off the ends like this and break the ones within. 
and I can break this into lots of smaller chunks with lots more contact points for the index and exopeptidases to work. So what they do is the exopeptidases, they hydrolyze. Remember, when you're talking about breaking or making bonds, you need to say what type of bond is made, whether it's condensation or hydrolysis. So I'm writing exo for short, you write the full thing. Exopeptidase is hydrolyzed peptide bonds at the ends of the molecules. And endo is the bonds within. But that hasn't explained why it increases the rate of protein digestion. All you've said is just what happens, and that's one mark, both of those statements. The other thing you need to say is that there is more surface area. It's more surface area, that means there's more action for exo-endopeptidases to do the job, so the rate of reaction increases. Now, as humans age, as humans age, there is a decrease in body protein. Give one body protein that could have resulted in reduced muscle power, so there's actin, myosin, tropo, troponin, tropomyosin, so I'm going to go with actin. And then reduced immunity, you've got antibodies, or you can also call them immunoglobulins. Scientists investigated the effects of two types of dietary protein on the ability of all men to produce body proteins, and here we've got physiological factors, so there's a rate, absor rate of absorption in dietary protein, Stimulation of protein synthesis and breakdown of body protein. So casein, uh, whey, whey has a higher rate of absorption than casein. However, casein stimulates protein synthesis higher than whey, but casein has no effect on body, break, body protein breakdown, whereas whey reduces it and inhibits it. So let's have a look at this next thing then. So figure four shows the percentage of protein absorbed that becomes body protein in old men following a meal of casein and whey. So the percentage that of, it, of the protein that's eaten, or sorry, absorbed, that becomes body protein is higher in whey than in casein, and a statistical test confirms that the difference between these results is significant. So you need to make sure you understand what this means. This means that this increased value here is actually statistically significant, and is likely to be due to something, not just by chance. It wasn't like they just got lucky and got these results. So to su suggest which type of dietary protein would be better for old men to eat to cause a net gain of body protein and use the information to balance your answer, basically. So, we need to talk about the overall thing increasing. So if we look at what's going on with whey, it's absorbed faster. Yes, it doesn't stimulate protein synthesis as much as it does as casein would, but it actually inhibits breakdown of body proteins and actually comparatively more of it's absorbed. Um, and it's a, it's a statistically significant difference. So that's, there's, a re you know, there's a significant increase of it being put into body proteins. So out of the two, that one's probably going to cause a net gain you know, to a more, to a higher extent. So whey, why? Because it's absorbed quicker. And as well as that, it still stimulates protein in the synthesis. Obviously not as well as casein, but at least there's still something, you know. It inhibits body protein breakdown. And there is a significant increase in the amount that becomes body protein. Right, so plants transport sucrose from leads to the tissues, blah, blah, blah. So one is a co transporter protein. They investigated whether the if the cells of tobacco leaves use set one to transport sucrose over tissues, and they used a radioactively labeled DNA probe to show that the tobacco leaves could take the set one gene to describe how they do this. Do not include PCR. So what they're doing is they're starting with DNA, which is double-stranded, and they want to put a DNA probe in there, and then they want to see if this radioactive DNA probe is present. So we need to talk about how we're going to separate this and make it in such a way so that it's, first of all, broken into the bit we want, because the set one gene might be here. We don't want to do it on the entire thing, we just want to cut out the set one gene, we want to be able to have it as a singular thing and hybridize with the DNA probe and then identify that. So in order to chop out the SUT1 gene and get the DNA fragment, we need to use restriction endonucleases. So you extract the DNA. And we add restriction endonucleases. So this will give us all the little pieces and fragments, right? But we need the one that has the SUT1 gene in. So we're going to separate fragments. And the only technique you can, you can, we, we know of that we could use that with is electrophoresis. So you separate the fragments using electrophoresis. Now that we have the ones where we suspect the SUT1 gene is present, you add the DNA probe. And this will hybridize or form complementary base pairs with, so hybridize with the SUT1 gene. And then we need to identify the presence of the bound probe. So in order to do that, we use a technique called auto 
radiography. So that's that's used in biology to identify radioactive things. You can also use it in the movement of radioactive carbon as well, and like does that in the phloem. To study the role of SUT1 in tobacco plants, they reduce the expression of SUT1 gene. So when SUT1 gene is transcribed, SUT1 mRNA is produced, and this is called sense SUT1 mRNA. And the scientists genetically modified them by adding an extra SUT1 gene that also in led to the production of antisense SUT1. So A only has SUT1, whereas B has SUT1 and this other like additional one here, whatever, right? So when they do that, they get sense mRNA, and here they've got sense and they've got antisense. Sorry, I meant the other way around here. This is supposed to be um, B, that's supposed to be A. So sense DNA is where you have your um, normal DNA strand, and the antisense is what's complementary to it. So what's going on here is the same thing. So it so suggests how the production of antisense, SUT1 mRNA, would reduce the expression of the SUT1 gene. So if we've got sense and antisense mRNA going, what can happen is complementary base pairs can happen, they can hybridize, and you get a double-stranded um, mRNA molecule. Now, translation of mRNA only works when it's a single-stranded mRNA molecule that goes to a ribosome. So in this case, the ribosome can't bind to it, so you get less production of the SUT1 protein. Because that's what it is. Expression of a gene is translating it. So transcribing into mRNA and then translating into a protein, which is why you need to know your protein synthesis. You just cannot get away with that not knowing it. I'm sorry, lad. So, antisense is complementary. The mRNA is complementary to sense. So what it does is it binds to it, binds to each other, sorry, via complementary base pairing. I'm just going to comp short for short. Obviously, you write the full thing. What happens is you get double-stranded mRNA, which cannot bind to ribosomes. Now, if that happens, you cannot produce the SUT1 protein. And that's how you get that reduction of expression. Okay, so the scientists hypothesized that lower rates of sucrose transport, blah, 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 reduce growth to test this. They, what they did is they got leaves of A and B, and they labeled carbon, they put radioactive 14 carbon dioxide, and they um, measured the percentage of 14 car radioactive carbon 14 remaining in the leaves for 16 hours, and here's their results. So type A, you know, you've got this decrease as, as the time goes on, but it kind of levels out, and here it also levels out too. Calculate the ratio of the percentage carbon-14 in B to A after providing them with this much. So the amount in A is 88, the amount in B is 38. Divide both sides by that and you get 0 0.4 to 1, or 0 0.43-ish, so there you go, there's that. In type B plants, the percentage of carbon-14 remaining in the leaves does not read 0%, as shown in figure 5, so just two reasons why. Well, I mean, obviously, it might have just stayed in the plant as something else, so what might have happened is that some of it might have been used to make cellulose. What also might happen is that, you know, not all of it might have actually been used in photosynthesis to make cellulose, you know? So it could be that, or also some of it, some of it could also be used to make starch. Or it could have been used to actually, you know, reform our UBP as well. And some of it might still be in GP or TP in the Calvin cycles. The scientists measured physiological differences between type A and type B plants, and here's the result. So the rate of sucrose transport from leaf cells is higher in B than in A, leaf sucrose concentration is higher in A than in B, and the ratio of shoot to dry mass is a higher in A than B, so there's more shoot than there is dry, root dry mass, and the rate of photosynthesis is higher in B than A. So it says use all the information, and this means everything in the question, not just this part only, to suggest and explain how the physiological factors in Table 3 would contribute to decreased dry mass observed in Type A. So it says use all the information, right? So in the first part of the question, we said that Group A had um, reduced SUT1 expression. They've even told you that as well. So there's reduced SUT1 expression. So what that means is that there's less sucrose exported from the leaves. So less sucrose exported from leaves. So the concentration increases inside the leaves. Right? Now the first sentence of this tells you that sucrose inhibits uh, the production of activity of rubisco. Therefore, you've got inhibited rubisco. And what does rubisco do? Well, it means it fixes carbon dioxide into GB, so there's less fixation into glycerate 
3 phosphate. Right? So that means that there's less, you know, ter fewer turns of the Kelvin cycle. Therefore, there are fewer useful substances made. E.g. glucose. Therefore, less growth. Therefore, less dry mass. Okay, so now we're on to the essay question, and I've talked about this before. Um, generally, what you want to do is you want to aim for like four or five topics. And it's all about the importance. So what you need to do is you need to say what it is, how it works. Why is this important and what the consequences are of not having this? You should try to choose topics that you are confident in and not say anything that's contradictory or incorrect and also something that isn't irrelevant. Because if you say something that's irrelevant, you get locked out of a certain amount of marks. So for example, um, if you have like, you know, more than one irrelevant topic, you are stuck at a maximum of about 15 marks. So just make sure to be careful on that. Now, obviously, choose the essay that you know more about and feel more confident about. I think one thing that's quite helpful is to, first of all, look at the essays before you start the paper. So you can kind of just mull over them a little bit to decide which one to pick. And also look at the questions in the paper as well. They give you lots of different contexts and lots of different applied scenarios. Maybe one of the things they tell you, like, for example, SUT1 may be useful in, in these essays, which can act as extra points to talk about. The other piece of advice I have is there's no point in trying to aim too much for those extra five marks where you go beyond the A-level spec, because again, if you say something irrelevant or something just horribly wrong, you could lock yourself out of getting more marks. It's better to play it safe here. Right. So now the two, to the two topics are the importance of complementary shapes of molecules and organisms or the importance of ions and metabolic processes. Now, if in all honesty, you'd be kind of insane not to pick number one because there's so much you can talk about. The way I like to think of it is write out a quick plan and list out all the topics you can think about that relate to this. So topic one is all about biological molecules. You can talk about enzymes and proteins. That's like entirely shape fitting. So if you were to talk about that, you would talk about the, the lock and key model, the induced fit model, why enzymes are important. So they are biological catalysts. They reduce the activation energy for a reaction to happen, blah, blah, blah. So that means that we can carry out more chemical reactions properly. And Chemical rea those chemical reactions can involve respiration, which provides energy for movement, growth, etc., and also photosynthesis, which is required for like you know all the conversion of sunlight for anything you know for all living things on the planet. So those are also really important to talk about. Without that, we'd have to invest so much energy in starting an, a reaction, which means we wouldn't have as much energy for movement, growth, and survival. You could also talk about DNA replication, which is quite important. You talk about AT synthesis and hydrolysis, which is re required for providing energy for reactions. That requires shapes fitting. Because the you know ATP synthase has to be complementary to ADP and PI, as well as that you can talk about transport across cell membranes. So for example, um, carrier proteins and the absorption of glucose, that's quite important. The immune system is a massive one you could talk about here. You know if you don't have complementary um, receptors to antigens presented to help the T cells by phagocytes, then you can't stimulate B cells to undergo clonal selection and produce monoclonal antibodies. You can't stimulate cytotoxic T cells. You can't stimulate more phagocytosis. So you get susceptible to disease and can, you know, get ill and die. And there's less energy for, you know, um, growth and development, reproduction, etc., and stuff like that. So there's obviously that. That's a massive one. Digestion and absorption is nearly all entirely to do with shapes fitting. And you need to be able, the whole point of digestion and absorption, the importance of it is to break down large molecules into smaller and more useful and, you know, manageable molecules. So for example, like starch into glucose, so that the glucose can be used in respiration and so on. As well as that, you could talk about um, photosynthesis and respiration. Those ones are pretty big. Receptors. So, um, you know, things like this uh, nervous impulses and synapses as well. You need to talk about, you could talk about those. Those are quite important. Excuse me. Skeletal muscles are quite important because when you have calcium that binds to the protein bound to tropomycin, it moves them out of the way. And so you can actually stimulate muscle contraction. As well as that, controlling blood glucose concentration. So when you have um, adrenaline, Bind, uh, binding to a receptor which then activates you know the whole second messenger model and all that kind of stuff that's quite important because it gets you ready for a fight or flight response you have more you have a higher blood glucose concentration meaning there's more you know glucose to res to use in respiration to generate energy for to get out of a dangerous situation and also survive controlling blood water potential as well so adh has to bind to complementary receptors and ho hormone receptors to actually do its thing or else if you don't you can have cells that shrivel and swell and it can lead to damage as well as that, you could talk about um, regulating transcription and translation, so methylation, acetylation, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Now, metabolic process is another one that to talk about as well. So, for example, you could talk about enzymes. Metabolic processes, you could talk about enzymes and digestion as well. 
you can talk about DNA replication. That's an important metabolic process. In order to actually be able to do mitosis and stuff, you need to be able to replicate DNA. As well as that, there's ATP, so hydrolysis synthesis, synthesis of it is important for energy. Inorganic ions as a whole, so there's lots of inorganic ions you can talk about. So iron and hemoglobin, that's quite important. Um, digestion and absorption as well as another metabolic process, mass transport in animals. So for example, using the circulatory system to get, you know, deoxygenated blood from the you know from the lungs into the heart into the rest of the body as well as that mass transport in plants so xylem and phloem uh, dna and protein synthesis i mean protein synthesis is essential for you to exist as a whole you know you, you need that to be able to you know make proteins like uh, immunoglobulins sorry antibodies um as well as that being able to um create more enzymes and stuff so that's also important photosynthesis and respiration i mean those are metabolic processes like essential uh what else could you talk about synaptic transmission as well so the um Hydrolysis of acetylcholine by acetylcholine esterase to prevent continued to prevent continued nervous stimulation, which can lead to muscle cramps and seizures and stuff like that. As well as that, um, you could talk about controlling blood water potential as well. That's another important metabolic process where you know ADH, you know where ADH does all of its jazz. And um, yeah, yeah. So as always, as I've said in every single other exam I've ever said, don't spend too long on this essay, but obviously try and just dump out as much as you can. You should at least choose four topics if you can and you're feeling gutsy enough try and go for five and make sure that they're again you know relevant don't choose anything that's irrelevant and um yeah as well as that you don't get credit for choosing topics that are beyond the a-level specification that are lower than a-level standard so if you remember something that you picked up from gcse and you kind of just throw it in there it doesn't count but yeah again thank you very much for watching please like share and subscribe um you know obviously it goes a long way if we can try and get the name out there a bit more, hopefully we can get more and more stuff going and more resources as well. Thank you.